Hello and welcome to the show. This is a special edition. I have Ralph Blumenthal and this is a few days after the debrief has released. A lot has happened since then and veteran journalist Ralph Blumenthal, welcome to the show. Thanks, Martin. Great to be with you again. Yes, it's always fun talking to you, Ralph. And uh, let's, uh, this is like a major happening in the UFO world and it's really shaken some things up. So the article came out, uh, I will pull it up and put it on the, the other uh, screen. A lot of people wanted to know, um, you know, I mean, that have gotten a hold of me, <clears throat> excuse me, on this. And th they wanted to know, you know, why the debrief and, and uh, which I think I'm not belittling in any type of way at all. They do wonderful work and I have some friends there and all that. So, but why, why was, why the debrief? Why did you go with the debrief? Um, well, you know, after 45 years at the New York Times as a staffer, and then I retired, um, uh, I, Leslie and I have done quite a bit of reporting for the New York Times, including our uh, big story in December 2017, uh, reporting the existence of a secret Pentagon office, which we called ATIP, uh, had other names, OSAP in the beginning. Um, that was investigating UFOs. So that was a big breaking story in 2017. We wrote a number of stories since then, including one um, very carefully written story on crash retrievals. Um, we ran this by the Times in an early version as soon as we got the information together uh, back in April. Um, and they didn't want to go, uh, you know, for the story. I mean, we, they, they accept and reject different stories for different reasons. Um, um, we got more information subsequently. So um, that was that was a simple reason. Uh, you know, it's, it's a long, difficult process to get a story approved at the times. And yes. at point yep. they passed, so we took it around and um, we were talking to the Washington Post. They were very interested in the story. Um, and then events uh, sort of accelerated, uh, as I uh, explained a little bit online. Um, and we felt that some pressure to put the story out quickly, more quickly than the Post was was prepared to go. Uh, and the debrief was a place where Leslie and I had both published previously. They're very expert in intelligence and defense matters. Uh, we are uh, it's highly respected, uh, very well plugged in, and they were prepared yeah. to, to move quickly. And that's where the story ended up. And uh, uh, it's gotten quite a reaction, as you know. Yeah, I was expecting their website to go down. It, it did crash a few oh, times. Oh, it did. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so what has happened what has happened in the three days since this was published? Well, a lot. I mean, the latest thing we hear is that people in Congress are pressing for hearings now, um, which is kind of the effect we wanted because one of uh, David Grush's uh, complaints uh, in the story was that uh, Congress has been lied to, he said, uh, illegally, uh, with, uh, information was illegally withheld from Congress um, on these uh, secret UFO or UAP recovery uh, programs. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, he, he wanted action from Congress and he actually filed a complaint that he was retaliated against uh, for his information, which is another aspect of the story. So the ball really was in, in many ways in, in Congress's court. And now it appears that it, it may be picked up and they want to have some hearings. So he might be able to say some things um, as a congressional witness that uh, he couldn't say before. Uh, and certainly he can he can back up things he told us in the debrief um, about details of, of these recovery efforts. Right, right. And um, there's. You know, there's a lot of people that have been asking a lot of different questions. And let's go back to the, the pressure of releasing this early or earlier. Um, I understand that there were some leaks. You know, I mean, this was going around. Someone called me a few weeks ago and said this was going to drop in the Washington Post. And, you know, pay attention for I think it was last a week ago, Monday. Uh, it was expected to go out and, you know, all that type of thing. How did. Are, are you aware of how the leaks got out there and David's name get out there on Twitter? Uh, no, we, we don't. But, uh, um, I mean, Grush's name did emerge on the Internet, which was very damaging because we had we weren't re ready yet to, to put out the story. I mean, it was all nailed down as far as we were concerned. Uh, and, and Martin, let me emphasize that everything in this story is on the record. No anonymous sources. 
Uh, everybody's identified. We even have pictures of the main people talking to us. Uh, Grush's um, uh, claims are uh, vetted, not, not necessarily vetted, but uh, he is uh, uh, acclaimed by different sources we quote by name in the article as, as reliable and truthful and person of integrity, et cetera. Um, so, um, um, so he was in danger as a source. He was getting uh, threatening phone calls. We, we don't go into a lot of detail about the, uh, the dangers that he was facing, but they were substantial. Um, and we had to get the story out. And we know that the mainstream media, I've worked at the New York Times for 45 years. I know what their processes are like, um, similar at the Washington Post. Um, so I don't fault them for the time they took on the story. We just couldn't wait around for the, for the process to be completed with, an, uh, with no end date in sight. So we felt to protect, uh, you know, David Grush and again, and because of the leaks that were coming out and, and the Internet can be a vicious place, um, certainly. Yeah, um, we owed it to him and to other sources to get the story out because the best protection for um, a source, as you know, in journalism, is to get it out on the record. Let right. those you know people be, um, you know, out there, and then then they have a degree of of safety that they didn't have before the story is put out. So that's that's the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> well, what what do you say to? I hear this out there. What do you say to we need more than claims at this point in the game? We need to see the receipts or proof. And how do we get more than just these claims? How would that move forward? Well, first of all, uh, David Grush, as we said in the story, uh, testified um, uh, in classified form to Congress. Um, and he pr and they produced a, a transcript of hundreds of pages. Uh, now, we don't know. Uh, what information he gave Congress that's protected by the, the secrecy constraints. Um, uh, there may well be more detail. I'm sure there's more detail than he gave us. There's no doubt about that. So the people who say, well, he didn't give any details, uh, we don't know the details he gave Congress. That's protected. Um, and as a matter of fact, when he spoke to congressional committees, he told them, um, in effect, he had to withhold certain details because they weren't cleared uh, at the level they needed to be cleared to receive this information. So even on a, on a committee level, staff level, uh, he couldn't go into all the details he wanted to, but he did share considerable class, uh, classified information with, with Congress. So um, again, we don't know the details he put into that. Um, it's absolutely true that we did not produce pictures of, of craft that he says the U.S. has recovered intact or in, piece, in, in pieces. Um, but th th those are very difficult pictures to get. This is uh, very, uh, you know, uh, carefully, uh, uh, you know, sec secretive information that the government has accumulated over many years. It's no, uh, not you know, not giving away any confidences to say that this, this information has been. Uh, held very closely for a long time in stovepiped, uh, you know, uh, uh, little pockets of, of um, the defense establishment and private industry, uh, defense contractors. So uh, this is not information that's easily accessible. It's heavily protected by, you know, classified, uh, um, you know, restraints. So, um, uh, but, you know, uh, how, how much did come out is interesting. What he was able to say uh, on the record and what uh, the Pentagon approved that, that he say, I mean, as we say in the article, he submitted uh, the things he wanted to tell us uh, to the Pentagon's Office of Pre-Publication Review. Um, and they approved it for, uh, you know, passing on to us. They didn't say it was true or not. They said there's no reason to withhold this information. Uh, it's not classified. So um, that adds, we, we feel, to his credibility uh, about these accounts that he, he knows of a uh, craft that was uh, retrieved, um, a craft of non-human origin. So, um, you know, that's the best I can say. Well, you know, the thing I hear out there a lot and that I would like to ask you is, wouldn't it seem as though if we were holding um, non-human technology off-world or whatever it, it, it is, uh, wouldn't that 
information that we hold this type of technology be highly classified? I mean, wouldn't it make sense that that type of information that he should not be able to even talk about it? I mean, how does that work? Well, you know, we have freedom of speech in this country and it, it, it's not giving away uh, details to an adversary. It's not national defense secrets to say we are holding a craft of, of a non-human origin. Um, he's not giving, you know, de technological details um, uh, about that. So, uh, and that's what the Pentagon essentially agreed when they approved his comments for, uh, for release to us. Um, uh, and by the way, you know, we make this point at the end of the article, this is information that really belongs to humanity. I mean, this yeah. is bigger than, you know, uh, one country's, uh, you know, defense uh, establishment. Uh, and by the way, we're not the only, we're not the only country uh, with this information. Uh, uh, the same things are going on in, in Russia and China, we understand. And, uh, uh, and, and David Grush, in his statements to us, to, spoke of this, you know, Cold War for retrieval of, of these objects. So, uh, you know, we, we know we're not the only, we, the U.S. is not the only one doing this. Um, but I don't think he, he's giving away a national security, um, you know, secret by saying we, we are holding this material. Okay. Um, what about the, the thought that, um, what if he was fed misinformation? Well, uh, you know, that's always the possibility that there's disinformation. Certainly the government has a long history of disinformation in this, uh, in this field of, of UAP, UFOs. Um, uh, sad history, in my opinion, uh, going back to, you know, World War II and, and just after where they denied uh, uh, sightings and put out, uh, you know, false information to confuse things, to stigmatize the subject because they couldn't deal with, you know, the facts that were coming out. Um, so, you know, anything is possible, but the fact that, uh, first of all, Grush is, is a very high level, or was a very high level intelligence officer. We give his bona fides in the article. Uh, he was with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office. He was a, a decorated soldier and officer in Af Afghanistan. He, he served on the UAP task force. I mean, he has a whole list of credentials. Um, and the people who vouch for him in our story, um, um, a, an army colonel who worked with him and uh, somebody else from NASIC, the you know, National Air uh, Space uh, Intelligence Center, um, again, uh, on the record, um, makes it more unlikely that he would that he and these other people would all have gotten together to promulgate a lie uh, to feed to, to the public. It, I mean, it, it doesn't um, it doesn't make any sense in, in, in that uh, interpretation. Well, I you know uh, to that point, um, it would be only speculation by them that he would actually come out and go forward with this uh, complaint to begin with. I mean, because um, if they were feeding that to him, you know, wh why would they know that he would complain? Do you understand exactly. where I'm going? You know, that's exactly. that's one of the one of the things I thought about. Do you now? This is a spec speculative question. Do you believe that what he went to with Congress? Um, classified documents that they they can't even talk about um, that he presented with them. Do you believe that those are very evidential of this of these uh, craft and and evidence? Well, you know, we don't know what he came to Congress with. Uh, yes. I mean, that is strictly protected. As a matter of fact, um, we can't even get comment from Congress because. Um, as we say in the article, uh, members of Congress are prohibited from discussing the identities of whistleblowers who come forward oh, yeah. with information yeah. to protect them. Uh, I mean, imagine if, if somebody were to come forward confidentially to Congress and their names would cro crop up in the paper because, you know, uh, members of Congress are, are discussing it. So it's understandable that, that they wouldn't be talking about this. Um, but um, so, uh, you know, so we don't know what what. Uh, information he brought forth and what documents he may have turned over to them. Mm -hmm. um, in your article, you state that Grush said 
that the craft recovery operations are ongoing at various levels of activity and that he knows the specific individuals, current and former, who are involved. It seems to me that these individuals are key, you know, and do you expect there's a possibility of any other people coming forward as witnesses? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, we, we uh, note in the piece that he is not the only one who's come forward. There are others uh, who come forward whose names have not surfaced. Um, and uh, I would imagine that people, you know, reading uh, our account and the subsequent coverage uh, uh, might be impelled, uh, sort of uh, inspired by his courage uh, in, in coming forward by, by name, that it might encourage others to come forward. You know, this has a way of building an avalanche effect, and um, uh, one person sees it, um, yeah. and it, it encourages others to come forward. So I do expect there'll be more uh, public witnesses. Yes, I had a conversation with Alejandro Rojas. Um, on We did a show about this, and that was one of the things um, that I believe, too, that it could be like the crack on the surface that, you know, that starts the ball rolling. Or, you know, I know that's a kind of a bad analogy, but it could be, you know, uh, some someone may it, it just may cause an avalanche. of. Well, you know, of, I'm you know. glad you pointed that out, Martin, because, you know, when people ask me about where we are in, in this whole, uh, you know, field, um, people like some people like to focus on what's you know what's still missing and you know what what we're lacking and how far we are from the goal of disclosure this magical capital D thing that uh, you know some people are waiting for uh, but I, I do like to point out that uh, we have come a long way uh, since the days of, of 2017 and earlier when our first article appeared. Um, when uh, before the government acknowledged, the Pentagon acknowledged officially that these objects are real, many of them, not all of them, but uh, that there's a legitimate uh, reason to, uh, to believe or to understand that this is a real phenomenon. These are not hallucinations, they're not hoaxes, they're not fabrications, they're not misunderstandings, it's not atmospheric effects. Um, there, there are cases uh, certainly of things being mistaken for, for uh, UFO, for UAP objects. But let's say there's uh, quite a body of uh, evidence accumulating that these things are real, that Navy pilots have encountered them, they've taken images of them. Uh, there's thermal imaging, FLIR images, there's photographs, there's eye, eyewitness accounts by highly decorated pilots like Dave Fravor. Um, so the government basically said in, in its last um, you know, big report, um, the one before that, the UAP report, um, uh, to Congress that these objects are real. Let's, let's admit that, okay, that, that there's a phenomenon that we don't know what they are. We don't mm -hmm. know where they come from, why they're here, who's behind the wheel, if, if anything, what intelligence you know, is, uh, is sponsoring or supporting them. But uh, at least um, these things physically exist. So that's that's a step. That's a big leap from where we were. Right. Um, I would say one of the number one things that people have been sending me, uh, you know, comments and emails on is uh, <clears throat> one, I don't have a very good record of my faith in uh, Bob Lazar. <laughs> but anyway, they uh, they have been saying, you know, well, isn't this proof that Bob Lazar saw what he saw? And I, I, I say no. And um, I guess I'll take your, what's your opinion on that? Well, you know, uh, I, I really don't have an opinion on Bob Lazar. I've, I've seen, you know, uh, stories about him. I have no reason to trust or distrust his account. Uh, but what, what we like to say, Leslie and I, is that we've taken this to another level. We have a named high intelligence or former high intelligence officer uh, who had unparalleled access, you know, in, in these corners of um, the defense establishment where these things were being uh, discussed and investigated. And he comes forward on the record and says this, this, and this. Now, and he's not saying that he put his hands on a craft. So uh, maybe that goes to his credibility also, that he's not claiming things that maybe go beyond his his knowledge. But he is saying, again, on the record, with, with, uh, with documents backing up his access, um, 
that uh, he knows that the government has retrieved intact and partially intact craft of non-human origin. Um, and I think that takes the, um, uh, the information a step above Bob Lazar um, because of, of Grosch's high uh, position in the defense establishment, high official position, which other people have corroborated. So yeah. uh, th that's all I can say about that. I'm not denigrating sure. anybody else's, you know, um, accounts. And I mean, a lot of accounts have come up, you know, been put forward over the years. People have, have said a lot of things. Um, the, the, the problem, as you highlighted, of course, is, is verifying it. And as close, you know, short of producing a craft, uh, dropping it into a, a hearing room in Congress, yeah. which I guess would maybe wouldn't convince everybody, there'd still be some skeptics out there. Oh, but sure. Of that, yeah. um, we have to deal with what we can deal with. And there are people coming forward with saying these things. So we have to evaluate that. Some people have sent, nicely sent me uh, questions for you on Twitter, and I want to thank you for that out there. Um, you know, the Wilson document, I've been on the fence about that myself for the last several years that that has been talked about. Is is there any type of tie-in that you're aware of? Are you familiar with the Wilson document? I am. Yeah. It did come up in one of the congressional hearings to great surprise. Right. Yes. Um, you know, I'm really not comfortable talking about that, at, uh, Martin, because that is, yeah. uh, it, All right. it, it's still um, it's a it's a uh, it's a very complicated story. It hasn't been, you know, the the document in question hasn't been sufficiently vetted in terms of uh, at least not, not on the record in, term, in right. terms of sources that will authenticate it. Uh, there's a lot of claims in that document. I mean, the problem in this field, as you know, is that there's a lot of information out there. Um, some of it is disinformation, by the way, from the government yeah. going back to the 50s, which is really, yes. um, you know, muddles the, the, muddies the waters considerably because the government put out um, uh, deliberately false information to confuse people uh, over the years. So um, the, the trick is, uh, you know, for someone like me with trained in classical journalism at the New York Times, is how do you verify this information before you exactly. put, it, put yeah. it out? Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. There's a lot of, you know, documents like that, and um, uh, they're, they're very tricky to handle. And Eric Davis will not has not commented, as far as I know, one way or the other on this whole thing. And that, right. that, would, that would definitely make a difference. Um, here's another one here. Could Ralph expand on uh, and talk about the whistleblower's legal representation? And did they look into the veracity of the allegations? Also, does Ralph expect anyone within the program to eventually come forward? I do believe we, we sort of uh, address that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Dave Grush's courage in coming forward. Uh, we know there are people on the fence uh, there about coming forward. We've talked to some of them um, and, uh, you know, we haven't been able to report uh, their identities or comments because they haven't come forward yet. Uh, but um, so the answer to the second part of that is, is yes, I think uh, um, uh, we, we can expect uh, more people to come forward. Um, and remind me again, Martin, of the first part of that question. Yes, uh, let me go back to it. Um, could you expand on the legal representation? Ah, yes. Um, Charles McCullough is a former um, um, in intelligence community inspector general. He was the first one, actually. The intelligence mm -hmm. community, which is something I didn't really know until I started doing this reporting, um, has an inspector general. Um, just to uh, monitor, uh, you know, legal requirements uh, such as the whistleblower statute, which uh, President Biden signed into law in December uh, last year, uh, which protects whistleblowers against just the kind of retaliation that David Grush claimed he was subjected to. He has been subjected mm -hmm. to. Um, so, um, so there's this inspector general who handles, you know, legal matters like this. And David Grush's attorney, Charles McCullough, was the first inspector general of the intelligence community. He left in 2017 uh, and joined a law firm. Uh, so he's very, very, very well plugged in, uh, McCullough is. Um, uh, and um, so he, he understands, you know, the, the intelligence establishment. And he's representing uh, Grush. Now, I imagine he wouldn't do that 
if he had doubts about Grush's veracity or integrity. Uh, but um, we, we use that in the story to show that he not only has high level representation, but somebody who has a history of um, involvement at the highest levels of, of, of this subject. Um, did he give you any type of idea of, is he being, was he being hassled or could he not even, even talk about it? He did talk about it and we allude to it in the article. We don't go into a lot of details because I don't think it would be helpful. Um, uh, but he was definitely um, subject to harassment. He lost uh, access to some of the uh, programs he was working for um, when he started coming forward. Uh, he has alleged this in an official complaint. The inspector general of the intelligence community uh, found his um, uh, complaint um, urgent and credible was the exact phrase. And it was forwarded to the highest levels of the defense establishment, Avril Haines and uh, others in the CIA. So um, uh, it was disseminated widely in the government that he, he was making this um, complaint. Um, and it's being adjudicated now. I mean, we, we don't have a result yet. Um, uh, that, that process is going forward. But he, uh, he has made those uh, com complaints, those charges officially. Uh, we have copies of what can be public about it. There's a classified version of his complaint that we don't have. But we have enough uh, to show uh, exactly what he complained of, that he was subject to harassment, he lost access. And it was as, some, kind of, as, he, as he complained, a kind of retaliation for coming forward, which is illegal under the whistleblower statute. He, he should not be retaliated against for coming forward through the proper channels. This is not coming forward to the media. This is coming forward to the proper defense channels uh, and Congress with this information. So he did, according to his account, exactly what he was allowed to do or encouraged to do by the whistleblower statute and yet uh, suffered these reprisals. Now, how is, how is this, was this being hidden um, from oversight? I guess that's the best way to put it. Is it pri in private programs or something in some way that it can, you know, duck the oversight, congressional oversight? Yes, he said that, um, that there are requirements. Uh, I mean, Congress is, uh, you know, has ultimate oversight over spending of taxpayers' money, and, and a lot of money is being spent in these secret programs. So uh, to, withheld, to withhold information from the proper congressional uh, channels um, is illegal, according to Grush's complaint. Um, and um, uh, he, he makes reference to um, some contracting procedures, again, to spend the people's money, uh, the government has to go through, uh, you know, certain um, steps uh, to protect against fraud and waste. Um, and according to Grush in, in his complaint, the, the public part of his complaint, which is the only part we saw, um, uh, th these procedures were not um, followed. Uh, in, in some cases, um, with regards to, to these programs. Now, these programs are super secret, the craft recovery programs uh, from, from what, he, what he says and what we understand from our reporting. Um, they're stovepiped in that there's no one uh, group of people or, or, or agency that has authority over, over everything. Um, they're held in very uh, uh, you know, uh, pr protected corners of, of the uh, of the Pentagon through special access programs, controlled access programs. Um, there's a whole mechanism. And I mean, the government has legitimate secrets. Let's, let's say that, um, mm -hmm. you know, for defense purposes. So the, the government has to keep certain secrets. We, we understand that. And they are squirreled away in these uh, corners of, of the Pentagon. Um, um, and, um, um, and that's where this information is kept. And also we understand uh, by some private contractors, defense contractors who are not amenable to freedom of information requests. So if you submit a FOIA to Congress, you're a reporter and you, and you say, not to Congress, you're a FOIA, you submit to the, uh, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, say, I want information about this. Um, the Pentagon has a mechanism for dealing, whether, dealing with whether this information can be properly disclosed to the public to a reporter for public dissemination. Well, that doesn't exist with private 
defense contractors. So if they mm -hmm. are running some of these programs, um, the FOIA process does not extend to them. And that's been a hang up uh, for a long time. We, we cannot get information um, from uh, from the private defense community on on how much they know about these these programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a statement that is in your article. It says several, several current members of the recovery program spoke to the inspector general's office and, co <coughs> and cooperated the information that Grush had provided for the classified complaint. How do we know that? Uh, well, we know that from our reporting. Um, we, you know, look, um, we, we talk to a lot of people for our reporting. It, it is like an iceberg to choose an old tired image that, you know, that the, the top part is what, what we put out in, you know, in our story, but it's based on a lot of reporting uh, that goes into it. Um, and then we choose from that reporting what, what we can put on the record, who will stand behind the statements, uh, what documents we can, uh, you know, uh, unearth to corroborate the statements we want to make. Um, so there's a lot of reporting that goes into a story that, that you know, uh, isn't part of the story itself because it's the background for the story. Uh, I mean, that should be clear. So uh, our reporting confirmed that there were others um, who um, were prepared to corroborate uh, Grush's information and in some cases have already spoken to Congress. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Was the article that you published part one of a multi-series? Huh. That, no, we you, didn't say okay. that, and uh, that would be jumping the gun. It's not a series. It's a freestanding article. You know, Leslie and I have been reporting on this together since at least 2017, when with, you know, Helene yeah. Cooper, we put out the big story in the New York Times. We continue to report on this all the time. We wrote a few, you know, number of stories since then in the New York Times. Um, both of us have published separately with the, the debrief that published our latest article. We're talking about this all the time. Um, uh, how to, you know, uh, gather more information. Uh, stories come to us all the time. Uh, we talk about what, what might make a good story, what would advance this, you know, uh, whole field. So um, we, we continue to report, but it's this article was not the beginning of a, of a multi-part series. Okay. And I guess I'd like to ask you right now, um, you know, since it's come out, we people, it's gone like wildfire. And is there something that you would like to um, nip in the bud that's out there that people are claiming? I mean, there's all kinds of claims, but yeah. is there anything you can think of right off the top that you'd like to nip in the bud? Well, you know, um, you're asking me to be a witness against myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you that one of the things is that, um, uh, you know, people ask, is this, you know, is, is, uh, a campaign? I mean, is this some... Uh, program to dribble out this information in a way the government wants. Um, and I, I've said before, and I can re reiterate that uh, this is not uh, anything that was spoon fed to us as part of any campaign. We had to dig it out very with great difficulty. We had to convince sources to go on the record. We had to assemble documentation. This wasn't handed to us for any nefarious purpose. After a long career at the New York Times, I can tell you I do not believe in these conspiracy theories. Too many people would have had to be in coordination to mastermind this as some kind of conspiracy to, you know, to dribble out a story in a, in a certain way. Um, it just doesn't happen that way in the real world, you know. So, so that's one thing I can say. Um, also, um, you know, I, I've been at this uh, in this subject for a while now, Martin. And yeah, um, I must say that I uh, I'm no closer to to answers about the essential mystery of this thing as, as I mm -hmm. probably was in the beginning. I mean, we yeah. don't what these objects are. We don't right. know, you know, what dimension some of these events um, that people describe are unfolding in. We, we think we understand the world of physics, but the world of physics ke keeps changing. There are new discoveries of, you know, the elemental particles of nature and uh, very complicated things, how the universe began, um, time warps, um, string theory, you know, all these very complicated um, concepts in physics that, you know, continue to change um, uh, or evolve. Um, and um, 
And yet the mystery uh, survives. You know, what are these objects? Where do they come from? Why are they here? Um, why do some people encounter them and not other people? Why do two people standing together, one sees it and one doesn't? Um, why are the, is the memory of it sometimes um, uh, in, apparently tampered with or interfered with so people can't remember certain things? I mean, there's a lot of questions, mostly questions, not answers. Right. Um, so, I, you know, what I like to say is that this is a mystery. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that my wife and I wrote a, a children's book that just came out on oh, yeah. UFOs. And we subtitle it Mysteries in the Sky um, because it is a mystery. And I think that's the, the thing you have to really start and end with, that we don't have the answers. We have questions. But at least uh, let's acknowledge the, the fact that these, there's the book, thank you, <laughs> um, that these uh, questions are legitimate and, and real. Um, they really are mysteries. And it's not a hoax. It's not a fabrication. Um, some people are mistaken sometimes, you know, they mistake a, you know, a satellite or a plane or a bird or atmospheric effect for a UFO. But, um, but in, you know, in the largest sense, these things, this is a mystery, just like other mysteries that we encounter. What happens after we die? You know, what, yeah. how did the universe begin? Is there a God? And these are all elemental questions and UFOs, I think, belong there. What are these things? Where do they come from? What do they want from us? Yeah. Um, so let's you know preserve that humility. And what I object to, frankly, are the people who uh, claim to have the answers, the skeptics, so-called skeptics, who's not really skeptical because they haven't really studied the field and emerged with real questions. What they have is a flip answer to uh, anything that comes out. Oh, that's nonsense. Oh, they're having a, a nightmare. Well, these things don't only happen at night. Uh, oh, it, you know, it's a fabrication. Well, these people, most of them, coming forward, don't want to come forward. They are troubled by what they encountered or what they saw, what they think they saw. So they're not rushing forward to get media attention, on the contrary. So, um, you know, we, we've got to preserve our humility here. This is a very difficult, uh, tangled, uh, mysterious field. And uh, let's start by saying we know uh, very little about it. Right, right. Um, I see a lot of uh, tweets by uh, Ross uh, Coldheart, who's coming out with um, quite a few people that are kind of corroborating a lot of this. Um, I wanted to know, have you? when's the last time you, you spoke with David? Well, Leslie's been mainly our contact with David. I We, we text back and forth, um, so mm -hmm. I would say daily. <laughs> yeah, how's he doing at this point? What is right. happening He's with him? Been, yeah, he's been inundated with attention, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it is a, um, uh, uh, a whirlpool. I don't know what the image is. I mean, once you get into this kind of a media sensation thing, uh, it, 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 it's really overwhelming. And I don't know if he realized, I mean, he's a, he's an, you know, he's a Air Force intelligence guy um, who is not used to dealing with the media. He came forward because of his courage and, you know, interest in, um, in, in uh, discussing this very important, uh, you know, uh, field that uh, information that he had, he had obtained, but he, he wasn't uh, used to this um, media whirlwind. And now suddenly he's in the middle of it. So I think yeah. he's, he's kind of overwhelmed uh, as we all are. I mean, there's been tremendous reaction to this piece. Um, and I've, you know, I've been in journalism a long time, Leslie has too, so we're kind of used to it. I don't think he is. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, uh, when this first dropped Monday morning, I woke up and said, whoa, you know, and I saw this. And uh, right away, immediately, there someone was, was putting out there, uh, he's just trying to get a, a movie deal. He's uh, just trying to get, you know, on TV. He's just trying to do this and that. Uh, what would you say to the people that are uh, coming well, out with that immediately? Anybody, anybody can disparage anybody with, you know, some uh, theory that they're convinced of, you know, that uh, these people are doing it for self-interest. We've checked this guy out. Nothing in his background suggested that he was interested in, you know, personal aggrandizement, um, that he had, you know, that he was um, media savvy or even interested in personal attention. He was an intelligence guy with a decorated officer in Afghanistan. Um, and yet 
um, he, he saw something here that didn't sit well. And this is what, you know, people do who have a conscience. And he thought that um, information was being improperly withheld from Congress. And what probably impelled him was the retaliation that he suffered as soon as he came forward. Um, you know, some people are intimidated by that. Other people are energized by it and determined not to, to, to be intimidated. And I think they picked on the wrong guy. Um, yeah. Good. So, um, yeah. you know, again, uh, nothing suggests we wouldn't have, uh, you know, attached our, our names and reputations to somebody who was out to, you know, uh, to make a movie. Right. That's good. Uh, his uh, tweet by Ross uh, Coldheart uh, about 16 hours ago, as Chris Sharp correctly points out in this article, AARO does not speak for the entire Department of Defense. Guff's ET denial was only on the behalf of the DOD AARO, not the DOD. Journalists need to ask the Pentagon more carefully. Does it categorically deny the knowledge of non-human intelligence? Which I yeah, think that's is a very good, good point. point. Yeah. These uh, denials that are coming out of the Pentagon, the latest statement from Susan Guff about AARO, uh, the old domain, you know, anomaly resolution office, which is the uh, successor to the uh, task force, uh, now because they all domain because they're noticing that these things operate in the water too. By the way, <laughs> yeah. um, um, not just the air. Uh, so these the responses are, are pretty carefully worded, um, and um, you're absolutely whoever tweeted that is absolutely right that you know the public and and journalists have to ask. Uh, the government, the Pentagon, more more um, openly and more dramatically and more uh, demandingly, um, are they saying that uh, Grusha's um, statements are not true? Are they denying his position in uh, former position in the government, the access to the information he had? You know, what part of it are they challenging? These statements are sometimes carefully crafted. Um, to be true in one sense, but they're, they're not true in the overall sense. And I'll say that at the same time that when you listen to the testimony of officials um, at the uh, you know, UFO hearing uh, in May of 2022, uh, that was also carefully worded. And Kirk Patrick's testimony recently to Congress, that was carefully worded. Um, so you got to really keep asking these questions. What is it that they're denying? I mean, sometimes the Pentagon officials say, I personally, you know, uh, have no knowledge of this. Well, they personally might not have that knowledge, but somebody else there does have that knowledge. So in any way, I, in any case, I think, uh, uh, it's very important to read these, um, statements of response carefully to see what the government is actually uh, you know, asserting here. And uh, I would be very curious and very dubious if they were to come forward now and say that Grush is not who he said he is and his access is not what he says it was, because we have basically, you know, uh, vetted that very carefully before we published our article. Yeah. For the person that's, um, for the person out there that likes to listen and watch shows like this and too lazy to read, <laughs> In a nutshell, can you tell us what his complaint, the gist of his complaint? Yeah, he says um, that he was a high level intelligence officer in various uh, intelligence agencies um, that that had responsibility for uh, UFOs, unidentified aerial phenomena, and that he knows from talking to people and information that he has seen as a result of his uh, privileged access that the U.S. has recovered over the years uh, intact and partially intact uh, craft vehicles of non-human origin. And that um, by uh, in, in uh, retaliation for coming forward with this information, he has been subject, subjected to illegal reprisals. Um, and that uh, and he has given this information not just to to the media, to, to Leslie and I, um, uh, you know, for this debrief article, but that he has supplied it to, to Congress, to members of congressional committees, to members of Congress. There was a hundred page, a transcript of hundreds of pages of his information classified. So you can imagine it's more detailed than what he told us. Um, um, so that really is, uh, I guess, the, the gist of the 
sensation to the story as it's been received, that he's on the record, he's a high-level guy with um, uh, really very high-level access, very well plugged in. His lawyer is a former inspector general of the intelligence community. Uh, other people vouch for him on the record uh, as, um, uh, you know, as a serious person, as an intelligence official. So that, to me, adds up to a good story. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, I'd like to I'd like to close the show with these two questions, and it's a, a two part question. When you go to publish something like this, things must go on, you know, in your head. You and uh, Leslie both must be thinking, okay, what's the worst case scenario when we publish this? And the second part that I'd like you to answer. What do you think the best case scenario? But let's start with the worst case scenario. Well, the worst case scenario for, for any journalist is that you got something wrong. You miss you miss something. Someone <clears throat> misled you or lied to you. Um, and uh, I think probably every journalist has had the experience, in, in especially in a long career, of waking up the next day and finding that uh, some terrible error has been committed. Something was distorted, left out. Um, somebody who told you something wasn't who he or she said you know, they were. Um, that's always a journalist nightmare, that you forgot something. That's why you work so hard to double check. And that's why there's so many levels of, of editing, uh, which, which we uh, absolutely support. And, and we had them at the debrief. They're very uh, dedicated and knowledgeable people there who are experts in defense and intelligence. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the worst case that you wake up, oh my God, you know, I put out a story that's completely wrong. Um, you know, I missed something, the person lied to me. Um, I was fed some information that was wrong. That is not the case here. I don't want a, this to go out as a, yeah. um, a clip that uh, he's saying that the story was wrong. Someone's um, going to edit it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You piece that together. A deep fake. Yeah. Um, so please, uh, that is not the case here. Everything we only gotten praise for the article, I must say, uh, uh, you know, it, it has stood up well. And that's every everybody's every journalist's greatest hope after an article runs. And the best case scenario is it'll have some effect. It'll wake up Congress. It'll continue to you know raise questions about uh, why this information hasn't been shared with, uh, you know, the American people, the world. This is not uh, you know, uh, secret information that has to be kept from humanity that, that we, we uh, U.S. agencies have recovered, according to what Gr Grush said, recovered uh, partial and intact uh, non-human craft. Um, this is a huge, you know, breakthrough for humanity, the way he described it. Um, and uh, Congress needs to address it. We need to go f further and see what, as, as um, um, you know, we also pointed out at the end of the article, there's possible scientific uh, advantages, breakthroughs that are uh, in store here if this information is, is correct, that this technology could be applied to the benefit of, of the entire human race. Um, so uh, that's the best case, that this really results in an opening of, uh, of the doors, more information within the confines of obviously classified uh, national security information. The government still has a right to keep certain secrets. We don't challenge that. Um, but um, within the ability of the government to um, promulgate this information, more and more needs to come out. Right. And... You know, you make a point uh, about the secrecy. There needs to be some secrecy, and I do agree with that. But under the big umbrella, I would say, of national defense, <clears throat> do you think we're going to see – this is a speculation question. Do you have any confidence that we're going to see some transparency on this whole thing? Well, I think the door has been, you know, uh, opened. Um, you, you know, genie's let out of the bottle. You can take whatever image you want. Um, you know, once people like Dave Grush come forward and say certain things, it's, it's pretty hard to unsay them. Um, so now uh, my expectation is that more information will surface. 
uh, more witnesses will come forward. Again, I don't question the need to keep certain information classified. That's uh, you know legitimate um, uh, mission of, of any government worldwide to protect its its people. Um, but uh, th this information, uh, some of it, go, uh, you know, goes beyond that. It's not uh, national security details or technology. It's just general um, information that is is world shattering if it's if it's true the way Dave Grush uh, said it. So, um, uh, yeah, I expect it to to open the door and. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it can only advance. It's pretty hard to to, to, to shut that door now. That's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, because of all the demands that are coming from different quarters. You know, the one last thing I know that I said that was the last question, a question ago, but it's not really a question. It's more of a statement. But I'm I'm a little surprised that this isn't like blasted all over the news everywhere. Do you think it's just momentum that it w eventually will be picked up by everybody you know from my perspective it is being blasted over the news i mean i'm getting you know i see it surfacing on tv stations uh you know mainstream media you know blogs uh podcasts so um, oh, yeah. yeah i don't know what more can can happen i mean um plus you know there's a natural progression to these things it, it kind of spreads so organically yeah <laughs> yeah, uh, I see a tremendous reaction so far, and uh, let's see where it goes. Yeah, um, I, I only say that statement because, you know, I'm out, out in the public, and my girlfriend also has, like, said, you know, called her cousins in, like, California, hey, did you hear? Like, a, no, no, I didn't hear. You know, eventually more people will hear about it. You know, I think everyone like us that pays attention to this is probably, you know, it's on the radar but it may not. Eventually, I hope it's on everybody's radar. Well, Martin, crazy. remember that there's a lot of terrible things going on in the world right now. The That's true. In Ukraine and, yeah. the, you know, poison air in New York. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, so this is a story. It's not the only story out there. It's a, it's a story. It's an interesting story, but the world is a big place. And yeah. there's a lot of tragedy going on and a lot of, you know, other things happening. So, uh, you know, we don't think that everything should stop for our story. I mean, uh, it has to take its place in a very fast changing news environment. And, uh, you know, Lord knows there's enough trouble going on in the world that, you know, uh, to, to distract your attention. So um, this will take its place with other things. It'll pass, you know people's attention will go on to other things, but we hope we've made some impact that will last here and that um, maybe, uh, you know, pry open the, the doors a little bit for more information. Exactly. Very well said. Ralph, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Martin, likewise. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. So um, I think that was a great, interesting show and uh, keep your eyes on this topic. Thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in.